Football Podcast Network, part of Sports Illustrated, giving you daily NFL draft, dynasty, and Devi fantasy football podcasts. Welcome into the Devi Seminar. I'm your host, Matt Hicks, the FF Educator, joined as always by my co-host, John Lobb, the Gridiron Scholar. And John, I am fired up today because we are jumping into our college fantasy football CFF positional preview episodes. We're going to start today with the quarterback position. John, I can't emphasize this enough. These next few episodes, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, we're going to cover all the positions here, and it's really crucial for you whether you are a huge CFF player like John, a casual one, a little bit more like me, whether you're a huge Debbie fan, or just a Dynasty fan that wants to start to get to know some of the names that are going to become relevant for you in a couple years. Whatever spectrum of fantasy football you're playing these episodes provide fantastic insight. And John, we got the Scott Fishbowl wrapping up, and we're already looking forward to another major league, the Kings Classic CFF edition. And so as much as I'm going to be uh, guiding John through this episode, I have my notebook out. I'm ready to dig into John's minds, one of the best when it comes to CFF across in the entire game. So John, I'm excited to have you on here, and I'm excited to talk about quarterbacks today. Absolutely. And the Kings Classic is Saturday, August 14th. We are broadcasting live from the FF Expo in Canton, Ohio. I've never been to the Hall of Fame. I'm over 50. I cannot wait to go that weekend. Just the whole event. So many people are going to be out here. And we are the CFF Kings Classic League. And Matt, for those people who love Debbie, Love the draft process. College fantasy football makes you a better scout, Matt. There's no question. This is my 13th year. If you played Debbie last year and college fantasy football, I guarantee you when the season kicked off, Zach Wilson and Malik Willis were on zero, zero Debbie squads. Within their first games of last season, Zach Wilson and Malik Willis became college fantasy football stars off the waiver wire. In your Debbie League, if you had picked up Zach Wilson within the first month, Matt, you were getting a free asset. Regardless of what you think for his NFL prospects landing with the Jets, And we've discussed it, Matt and I, and you can go back to the draft seminar. The reality is you picked up the second overall draft pick in the NFL at quarterback for absolutely free. That is a huge asset to be able to trade. And Malik Willis, friends, he he was on like 2% of college fantasy football rosters When I picked him up last year, he became the number one quarterback, and now you see him rising in the Debbie community. And, Matt, you didn't even have to pick up Malik Willis in the first part of the season. He was available probably until late November in Debbie leagues. Now, why do I like those two players? Why did I jump on them so early? Because of college fantasy football. Now, if you're playing in a Canton to um, camp or what well, a campus to can lead. This is the place to start college fantasy football. It is so enjoyable, ladies and gentlemen. Jump on board, get into a league, and become a better Debbie and campus to Canton owner. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, just running some quick tech. Ah, All right, right, there we go. Um, Absolutely, John. I'm excited to jump right into it here. Let's start talking about some of these quarterbacks. And I'll uh, preface this conversation by saying there's multiple forms of college fantasy football, just uh, just power five. We include the group of five. We go deep. We go across the country here. And a really interesting guy to start with here at number 24, 
Bailey Zapp, and if you remember correctly here, or maybe you wouldn't even have, uh, he <laughs> was a, 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 a Twitter phenom for probably about a four-week period. I think he only had four games at the small school in Texas. John, you'll be able to give me the exact name. And now he's at Western Kentucky uh, as a senior leader, and I think we have some really, really intriguing CFF. I'm so glad that he is on our list here. Absolutely. He played at Houston Baptist. There we which go. Which is the FCS level. Now, through my 13 years of playing college fantasy football, there are quarterbacks at all positions, but we're on the quarterbacks today, who move up to the FCS level, group of five, power five, and have success. Zap is that guy. His offensive coordinator and quarterback coach, Zach Kitley, Coach the air raid offense at Houston Baptist. The a lot of the staff came over to play at Western Kentucky. Zap knows the system. This is incredible. His last full season, Matt, in 2019, threw for 3,811 yards, 35 touchdowns. That was obviously in the Southland Conference, so it's not the FCS level. But Western Kentucky is playing in a defensively challenged conference. They're going to score points. My partner, Nick Allen at CFB Winning Edge, on fan tracks, his projections are 24 and a half points per game for Bailey Zapp with uh, Western Kentucky. Grab him. I love him as a number two quarterback. John, by the way, Western Kentucky, one of the best mascots in college athletics. Big Red, Big Red the Hilltopper. He's just a little blob. <laughs> yeah. If you've never seen him, you got to Google Big Red of Western Kentucky. All right, John, moving on to number 23 here. I, this is, I'm so glad we're talking about Max Dugan at a TCU because I think folks, the casual Dynasty fans, or even some, they have such a bad taste of Max Dugan because in the 2019 draft cycle, when Jalen Rager was coming out, or I guess that would be the yeah 2019 draft cycle when Jalen Rager was coming out, all of the, the Jalen Rager hype was founded on the idea that Max Dugan was very bad at football, which I don't think was a good narrative. And I think we kind of saw that play out uh, in terms of the NFL. And a lot of buzz and hype is coming out surrounding and supporting Max Dugan as this being his step forward year. So talk to me a little bit more about the TCU uh, passer here. Matt, we always look for dual-threat quarterbacks in college fantasy football. We've been doing this for 13 years. The NFL, they are finally at the dual-threat level because that's what's coming up from the lower level. They've had to change their offense. For the last two years, Max Dugan has rushed for over 500 yards, Matt. That is fantasy gold. It gives you a huge floor on a weekly basis. He has also completed 25 career touchdowns in 22 games. He's obviously more prolific with his legs. Now, the Horn Frogs have taken a little step backwards in the last three years, but they finally have some very nice pieces on this offense that we're going to talk about over the next four weeks. I like Dugan this year a ton. If he's your second quarterback, Matt, he's a, he's a great second quarterback. Absolutely. And John, I think this next guy is a perfect example of how a value can swing between <laughs> Devi and between college fantasy football, because Jeff Sims at a Georgia Tech is really the hotness in a lot of Devi circles right now for the exact reason you mentioned, that dual threat capability. But what folks need to make sure they understand is that Georgia Tech is still an offense uh, getting to know itself. Maybe we'll put it that way. The new head coach is still rebuilding the offense, and he comes in number 22 here for you. What's the upside and maybe some hesitations behind Jeff Sims? I'm very bullish on Jeff Sims, my friend. In 10 college fantasy football drafts, I have him already in 40%, so I have him in four leagues. When he falls, I'm ecstatic. Last year, as a true freshman, and Matt referenced it, the Yellow Jackets used to be a triple option offense. I've been watching them since Calvin Johnson and Demarius Thomas was there, and they literally would get like 50 targets a year in that triple option offense. So Jeff Collins has had to recruit 
a different athlete. I mean, it's a the whole roster construction, what you're looking for is completely different. He got Jeff Sims to come to Georgia Tech last year, Matt. He started off poorly. He had eight interceptions in the first three games. The rest of the year, he only had five. That's impressive for a freshman. He had 1,881 yards passing, 13 touchdowns. But where is the fantasy gold, Matt? 492 yards on the ground and six rushing touchdowns. I am all in. The Yellow Jackets are turning this program around. Jeff Collins is a good coach, and Jeff Sims is a great college fantasy football quarterback. All right, you're going to notice a trend here as we move on to number 21 with Malik Cunningham out of Louisville. Cunningham, another guy, dual threat capability. He's an experienced starter. He flirted with the idea of declaring for the 2020 NFL draft, 2021 NFL draft, I should say. And it seems like, John, that he is going to be the experienced one, hopefully bringing Louisville back to the 2019 offensive production, which was much more successful than the 2020 production. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And Cunningham, detractors are going to point to that the Cardinals have lost J.V. and Hawkins, Tutu Atwell, and Des Fitzpatrick. I understand that. However, Scott Satterfield, who used to coach at Appalachian State, is a very good offensive coordinator. They have players in the pipeline. You have Malik Cunningham, who has passed for over 5,000 yards and rushed for fifth, over 1,500 yards. He is, this is amazing, Matt, 43 career touchdowns and 18 touchdowns on the ground. While I know there's a little bit of risk with turnover, I believe in the coaching staff and the scheme, and Malik Cunningham is a good dual threat college quarterback. I like him. He's number 21 on my list. Fantastic here. Speaking of dual threat college quarterbacks, number 20, De'Eric King out of the University of Miami. Now, John, this is an interesting one because De'Eric King, of course, has been a staple of college football for what? It seems like three or four years now. Coming off of a pretty serious late season lower body injury, the expectation is that he's going to be ready for camp and ready for the start of the season. But I I at least think you have to proceed with a little bit of caution, right? Absolutely, and Matt, I'm lower on Derrick King than other CFF experts because I saw that bowl game against Oklahoma State where he hurt that lower leg. Miami is claiming that King is going to be ready, but we didn't see him in the spring game, and that was a pretty tough injury. And Matt, he has been around. He was at the University of Houston. Derrick King was one heck of a college fantasy football player. And even last year for the Hurricanes, who weren't a great team, they had some parts around him. He had a 23-5 to touchdown to interception ratio, and he completed 64% of his passes. If you get him at value, Matt, and he slides down the board, I'm going to take him. But in the drafts that I've been in, he usually goes earlier than I'm willing to embrace the risk of the injury. Now, if we see him, you know, second week of training camp on the field, then I would obviously move him up. But right now, I'm not willing to take the risk. All right. From Miami to De'Ara King's former institution, that is Houston. We're going to be talking about Clayton Toon, who I think is a guy floating a little bit under the radar, John, but some dual threat upside ability here as well. Absolutely. One of those players, if you're not paying attention and you're not looking at the statistics or you don't watch Houston, he had over 250 rushing yards last year and five touchdowns. And that's not as good as Jeff Sims or Cunningham. However, it does provide a very nice floor. If you're drafting Clayton Toon, you're banking on coach Dana Holgerson. He was excellent at West Virginia and his other stops in his career as an offense coordinator and as a coach. He has not gotten this Cougars offense to ignite like he does at other places. But Clayton Toon is very good, Matt. He can be a very productive. I have him at number 19. And Matt, I actually have some of them because he falls really deep. All of a sudden in round 10, 11, Clayton Toon is on the board. I'm taking him there. 
Absolutely. Reading it back here, 24 to 19, our first group of quarterbacks, Bailey Zapp out of Western Kentucky, Max Dugan out of TCU, Jeff Sims from Georgia Tech, Malik Cunningham out of Louisville, Derek King from Miami, and Clayton Toon out of Houston. John, let's go ahead and jump here to 18 through 13, and we're going to go back to the MAC, or I should say we're going to head to the MAC here with Caleb uh, Ellaby out of Western Michigan, and uh, you're going to have to talk to me about Ellaby a little bit here, John. Ellaby is a darling in the CFF community right now, Matt. I like him. I have him at number 18, and it is because of the upside with his legs, Matt. Again, he is this dual threat quarterback. Also, I love the Mid-American Conference quarterbacks. When you have a good one, Nathan Rourke, Cooper Rush, Zach Terrell, Logan Upside, all these really good MAC quarterbacks who I have rostered in college fantasy football, Caleb Ellaby is in that category. He had 18 touchdowns passing and four rushing last year. He's 6'1", 215 pounds. Matt, he has the body of a power five quarterback in the skill set playing at the MAC conference in the group of five. I like him a ton, especially with that rushing upside. All right, coming in here at number 17, John, John is a former uh, big recruit, started at Washington, transferred to Fresno State. That's Jake Hayner. Oh, Jake Hayner. Most people are probably not staying up and watching the Mountain West like I do really late at night. A mistake. A mistake. (laughs) A mistake. And Jack, Jake Hayner, who transferred from Washington, as Matt said, in six games last year, he completed over 64% of his passes for 14 touchdowns and over 2,000 yards. Why do I like him even more? The Bulldogs averaged over 30 points per game for the last three seasons. Matt, he has Jalen Cropper coming back, one of the best receivers in the nation. The only downside with Jake Hayner, he might throw 30 touchdowns. Matt, he doesn't get anything with his legs. He only has 80, he had 89 or less than 100 yards rushing last year. And any rushing touchdown would just be a random bonus like Eli Manning when he used to get one every three years for the (laughs) Giants, right? So I do like Hayner, but his ceiling is limited because he doesn't put the ball on the ground a lot. Number 16, John, is one of the most hotly debated guys heading into already the 2022 NFL draft cycle, and that is Keaton Slovis out of USC. For some folks, they consider him to be a first-round talent. For some folks, they're totally off of him. When I was doing my evaluation this summer, John, I called it the tale of two quarterbacks. You go back to 2019, (laughs) and you see somebody with QB1 overall potential. I mean, a gunslinger puts the ball in the perfect spot. Fantastic mechanics. And he's even alluded to this in interviews. In 2020, he was not confident. His mechanics were a mess. He was out of rhythm. And there's rumors that he was also working through a throwing arm injury throughout a shortened, weird, odd USC season. So I want to believe that Keaton Slovis is going to come back closer to 2019 form, but there's yellow flags all over the place here, John. Oh, absolutely. But Matt, I'll say one thing, and I've got to study him more. He's at number 16 on my board right now, and that's because, as you know, he actually had negative yards rushing. I believe, the last two seasons. Because if you don't know, a sack counts against your rushing statistics in college, everyone. I hate it. So it's uh, I do too in college football. So he has negative yards rushing. So that caps him. However, they signed Jake Smith, transferred from the University of Texas just this week. Matt, they are six deep at the wide receiver position. Oh, yeah. Keaton Slovis is really, I, I'm looking at it more. I'm trying to project what his upside is. Because if you go look at the USC six wide receivers, folks, they, I will argue, they are the deepest six in the nation when you include experience in that top six. Keaton Slovis is poised in Graham Harrell's offense to rock. And this is going to decide his draft capital. He needs to throw about 34 touchdowns and play much better, Matt, 
but I have him in number 16, and I might move him up. I'm doing some more research into the numbers. But because of that rushing, I can't move him up too high, Matt. Yeah, John, if we were playing a Scott Fishbowl CFF style, we'd like Keaton Slovis because he protects the ball well, too. He doesn't uh, throw a lot of turnovers there. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, John, Let's uh, now we're going back to the MAC here with Preston Hutchinson from Eastern Michigan University. Preston Hutchinson, 6'2", 203 pounds. Last year, he rushed for 206 yards and eight touchdowns. He passed for 1,662 yards and 12 touchdown passes. Eastern Michigan is not very good, folks, They but they have a very friendly schedule. And Preston Hutchinson is probably the best athlete on the field in most games that he's going to suit up in. Preston Hutchinson has the possibility – of producing between 36 and 40 total touchdowns this year. I like him a lot, man. You want a dual threat running back, Preston Hutchinson is your guy later in the draft. A darling of the 2020 season coming out of Coastal Carolina was Grayson McCall. True freshman, absolutely hit the ground running there, put up big stats. And, John, at 14, we're expecting another big season from him. Huge season. I love watching Coastal Carolina last year. They were just so much fun, and they're explosive on offense. McCall is a master of RPOs out of the pistol formation. Coastal Carolina runs that pistol to perfection. What I like about Grayson McCall, Matt, 6'3", 210 pounds. This is a big young man playing quarterback. He can absorb the hits and he can throw the football. He was the all-sun belt quarterback, and he was the conference player of the year. He had 26 touchdown passes and seven rushing touchdowns. But where the gold is, 569 yards rushing. They designed plays for Grayson McCall with his legs. He is a star in college fantasy football and in real college football. Absolutely. Heading into number 13 here, the last quarterback in our uh, group of 13 to 18 is Carson Strong out of Nevada. Carson Strong is somebody who is absolutely on the 2022 draft radar. John, I was very excited watching his uh, tape putting together the summer evaluation for him for the rookie big board. I have here, I'm just reading off my notes, a raw passer with some serious upside, man. He's got a big arm. He's not afraid to use it. He pushes that ball 50 yards downfield. And, John, it's a little inconsistent, but at times there is incredible precision with his with his passes past 50 yards downfield. Now, he's got to hone in his mechanics. He's got to get a little bit more consistent with his accuracy. But Carson Strong, if you're looking for that guy that for a lot of folks might come out of nowhere and onto the NFL draft scene as a first-round quarterback, Strong is absolutely an option here. Big arm, but I'm sure you're going to reference this, John. He's going to be limited to being in the pocket. <laughs> oh, yeah. And this is where I love college fantasy football. Completely different than NFL draft analysis, Debbie analysis. I have Carson Strong in my top five Debbie quarterbacks. He is probably going to be a first-round pick, barring the disaster. But that Wolfpack offense is loaded, my friends. If you have not watched the Wolfpack, they scored 30.8 points per game last year. They were fun, and they are loaded at the receiver position. And Carson Strong is 6'4", Matt, 215 pounds. And dare I say, he has a tremendous arm, dude. His arm is great, and he's very accurate deep down the field. The challenge is they're going to blow some people out. And he might mm -hmm. have three touchdowns in the first half, and he might throw for 250 yards. But in college football, sometimes they pull the dogs off and they rest, and you're not going to get that two rushing touchdown game. Great floor. He's going to probably play every game and produce extraordinary passing stats. But he's lower in college fantasy football because he doesn't give you that rushing. 
We have them projected at 16 yards rushing this year, Matt. Just shows you you're not going to get anything with the legs. All right, here, heading into the top 12, and we're going to start with Desmond Ritter out of Cincinnati. I think this is interesting because Desmond Ritter is another player who might kind of be grouped in with Carson Strong at times in the draft conversation, although they're much different players. Ritter's, I think, more of a pure athlete that happens to throw the ball. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, it makes for a sometimes infuriating tape review. But when it comes to the college game and when it comes to college fantasy football, Ritter is absolutely somebody I'd want on my team. Without question, Matt, and it's an it's an interesting discussion. I have Carson Strong ahead of Desmond Ritter on my Debbie um, rankings. But college fantasy football-wise, Desmond Ritter in the last three seasons, Matt, he's a senior now, everyone, 6,905 yards passing. This statistic I like a lot. 57 touchdowns to only 20 interceptions. He's very smart with the football, but where is the enticing upside? 1,825 yards rushing, 22 touchdowns on the ground. Last year, Matt, he scored 30 fantasy points per game. That is amazing. 6'4", 215 pounds. Anyone knows I love the American Athletic Conference. I've watched a lot of Desmond Ritter. And man, I spoke about it earlier on our last on our um, Debbie Bingo game. I'm a little lower on Desmond Ritter than there are out there in the Debbie community because I think he's a great athlete who throws the ball, not a great quarterback who has athletic ability. There's a difference, but from a college fantasy standpoint, I love Desmond Ritter this year. John, somebody who I think is flying under the radar for a lot of folks is Brandon Armstrong out of Virginia. I'm glad he's on our list here. Oh, Matt, if you've been following Bronco Mendenhall like I have for a long time, he was oh, a, yeah. he's a good coach, very underrated. Now, he's been at BYU and Virginia. You're not going to win national championships at those two schools. But Bronco Mendenhall puts together a very good team year after year. They play defense, they run the football, and they have dual-threat quarterbacks. I went back into the time capsule to look at some stats, Matt. Bronco Mendenhall had Tyson Hill, yes, of the Saints, folks. He had in his best year of 2013, 2,938 passing yards, 1,344 rushing yards, and 29 total touchdowns. Two years ago, Bronco Mendenhall had Bryce Perkins. He had over 3,500 yards passing, over 700 yards rushing, and 33 total touchdowns. Last summer, I had read that Br Brennan Armstrong had won the job in training camp. I immediately told everyone on my waiver wire, on the waiver wire we did on Fantrax and in the CFF on campus podcast, go pick up Brennan Armstrong. He ended up with 2,100 yards passing, 552 yards rushing, and 23 total touchdowns. Virginia's better than people give him credit for. Bronco Mendenhall's a good coach, and Brennan Armstrong is a star in this system. All right, John. Speaking of stars, Dylan Gabriel is somebody who has absolutely lit up the college world here over the last uh, couple seasons. Hit the ground running, John, as a true freshman and sophomore has put together 7,200 passing yards and 61 touchdowns. Now, the caveat with Dylan Gabriel, we have a little bit of variability here. New coaching staff coming in here with the head coach, obviously having left for Tennessee here. Now, I think we're, we're rocking with the same system here, and it should still be high-flying with Dylan Gabriel. But there's always a little bit of a caveat when you get a new coaching staff in town. Matt, it would be coaching malfeasance to change this UCF offense too much. Right. You're going to tweak it. And I expect Gus Malzone to add his little tweak to it. But if he changes it too much, they're going to, they're just not going to produce. For one, Dylan Gabriel is not a rushing quarterback, folks. He is not your typical Gus Malzone dual threat like Cam Newton. And some, um, he had, ten, it was a Marshall. I forgot the quarterback's name before Cam Newton or after Cam Newton. Last name was Marshall. 
um, at Auburn. He, he's not that type of player. He is a really good left-handed thrower. Matt alluded to it. The passing yards are incredible. And he started basically his second game as a true freshman. But two stats that I love to talk about with Dylan Gabriel. 156.6 quarterback ranking right out of high school. And 61 to 11. 61 to 11 touchdown to interception ratio. I wanted to put Dylan Gabriel higher. But at, with the changes with Gus Malzone and the question marks about the tweaking of the offense and with his lack of upside running ability, I have him in the top 10. I wanted to put him higher, but I just can't. You're thinking of Nick Marshall, John. It's Nick, Nick Marshall. Marshall. That's it. Yes. That's the dude. All right. On to number nine here, DTR, Dorian Thompson-Robinson out of UCLA. John, another guy that I feel like has just been playing college football for absolutely forever, but he hasn't. He's just been starting for four years now. This will be his fourth year. And we want to talk about an athlete here. Thompson-Robinson is absolutely an athlete in the way he attacks the game. Oh, when you watch the Bruins and Chip Kelly's offense, Dorian Thompson-Robinson is unbelievable athlete. However, we've had some challenges. He misses some games. And the Bruins haven't been very good. Chip Kelly, <laughs> since his stay at Oregon, Matt, has not been very good in the NFL or in college football. He is 10-21 and 21 at UCLA, and he's 10-15 and 15 in the Pac-12. Let me just say, that's bad. But... <laughs> But he has found a very nice dual-threat quarterback. Dorian Thompson-Robinson is average 28.9 and 20.6 fantasy point starts over the last two seasons. But what I love about him, especially in best ball, his ceiling. He has two games, Matt, where he just went nuts against Washington State. And this is when they had – um. Oh, who's the quarterback of Jacksonville last year? Everyone's darling. Gardner Minshew. Gardner Minshew. They were at Washington State, and DTR passed for 507 yards <coughs> and five touchdowns, and he scored twice on the ground. Last year, versus Colorado, he had six total touchdowns, passed for 300, and ran for 100. Dorian Thompson-Robinson is stupendous in best ball when you don't have to predict which games he's going to go off in. But he is very good because he does have a nice floor, but he is up and down on a weekly basis. He's in my top 10. I like him a lot to be solid, really solid this year. All right, John. Of course, somebody at the top of – I think everybody knows this name here. It's Sam Howell, the quarterback for UNC. Howell, of course, had a, a dazzling freshman season for the Tar Heels. And I think last year he came back to playing a little bit more of a really good quarterback play, but maybe not as mind-blowing. And it'll be interesting this year losing Daz Newsom, losing Diami Brown, losing Michael Carter and uh, uh, Javante Williams here. Now they have certainly some pieces coming in. It's not a full exodus of talent. But it'll be interesting to see what Sam Howell does with this UNC offense this season. And, Matt, again, just like Carson Strong, this illustrates the difference between Debbie, NFL prospect, and college fantasy football rankings. Sam Howell, now he's good with his legs. He's actually a little underrated. People don't give him enough credit. If you watch the games, he can run the football, folks. Now, he's not super dynamic, but he's not. He's much better than Keaton Slovis and Carson Strong with his legs. But there's so much turnover. And Mac Brown, that offense is loaded. So we like the players coming up, but they are new offensive playmakers. So there is some challenge there for Howell. And I play college fantasy football long enough. I've seen this happen so many times. Freshmen or sophomore have very good beginnings to their career, but then the talent around them drops off because of graduation, coaching changes, and they drop off. So when I have that many question marks, not concerns, question marks, I move Sam Howell down to number eight. 
if you're looking for a quarterback with a solid floor, you're going to get 23 to 25 points every week. That is Sam Howell. I question, does he have the 40-point upside right right now? Matt, I don't think he does. And to get in my top six, I want to be able to say that this player on any given Saturday can score over 40 points. And I just don't see that with Howell. That's why he drops down to number eight. All right, John, from one National League program to another here, we're going to go to Ohio State. And C.J. Stroud, who we are anticipating, will be the starting quarterback. <laughs> I don't I don't think Ohio State has officially named him to be, but it seems like C.J. Stroud is going to be the guy. John Stroud, really interesting recruitment profile. We haven't seen him on the field yet for Ohio State. He was the Elite 11 quarterback winner, I believe, in the 2019 cycle. Yeah, uh, And I believe, if I'm correct, he was actually a three-star going into that competition and ended up being a four-star quarterback recruit for Ohio State. And obviously, John, this is a system that produces big points for the quarterback position. So although we know fairly little about C.J. Stroud already, it's kind of a plug-and-play here. There's some good floor just being the Ohio State quarterback. Matt, take aside Justin Fields, and we know how good he was. Ohio State, JT Barrett, Dwayne Haskins were superstars in the Buckeyes offense. Superstars. Not good players, folks. Superstars. So then when they got Justin Fields, he was a Heisman candidate. C.J. Stroud is a better prospect than both JT Barrett and Dwayne Haskins. Also, remember Cardell Jones won a national championship in this offense. When I look at C.J. Stroud, I watch the spring game. Matt, 16 of 22, 185 yards and two touchdowns. But what makes him so special is the talent around him. I would suggest if you draft Stroud, and I have a couple times already, you need to get Kyle McCord. The other star, the Buckeyes are just so loaded. They have another five-star prospect, Kyle McCord, who's who's a freshman this year. You draft C.J. Stroud, and then you back him up with Kyle McCord. As of now, and Matt's correct, they have not officially named the starter at Ohio State. But everything that I read and every bit of kernel that I can get, C.J. Stroud should start for the Buckeyes. And for those not familiar with college football, there's a little bit of gamesmanship often when the starting quarterback is not named because I believe the the deadline has passed. I believe it was July 1st. There's a, there's a date where quarterback or all players are locked into being on the roster. They can't transfer anymore. And that helps the program keep a good backup quarterback because we know how important that is uh, for college football. All right, John, let's move into our top six here. (laughs) Another guy who we have only seen, uh, I don't don't think, um, more than 50 snaps on the field here, and that's Bryce Young out of Alabama. But if you want to talk about big-name recruits, and if you want to talk about uh, offensive systems that you want to play in, Bryce Young is an automatic top option here. I can't wait. I've drafted a ton of Bryce Young in Devi. I'm excited to do it as well in college fantasy football. just, Just sing the praises of Bryce Young for me, John. Matt, I'll say this before we talk. These six quarterbacks, I have not left one of my 10 drafts without one of these top six college fantasy football quarterbacks. Here's why, my friends. All six of these players have 40-point upside and should do it at least twice each with 50-point possibility like Malik Willis and Spencer Rattler. Even Matt Corral has 50-point upside. I love these six quarterbacks in college fantasy football. I got made fun of in 2018 when I was drafting Tua Tunga Viola in the first round. People are like, you can't draft an Alabama quarterback in the first round. They still were thinking that Alabama was in the 2013 mindset. Last year, I stated multiple times, and I'm as guilty as anyone, are we undervaluing Matt Jones? Like, Matt Jones was going off as like the 40th quarterback in CFF leagues. He was mostly a third quarterback on CFF rosters, and he was tremendous last year. Finally, the college football community is caught up. 
Bryce Young is the next star in this system. There is no reason to believe that Alabama can't produce another superstar. Six foot, 194 pounds. The number one ranked dual threat quarterback. And last year, Matt, I think you and I had spoken about this on another show. There was an opportunity last year. Bryce Young might have wrestled the job away from Mac Jones. But with COVID, with the late start, the lack of training camp, Mac Jones, they kept with the upperclassmen, and then he never lost the game. How are you going to take Mac Jones off the field? I see everything you want to see in Bryce Young. You know the scheme is there. The coaching staff is there. The offensive talent around him. Love Bryce Young. The only thing is, I do worry the receivers are good. We just haven't seen it yet. So I have him at number six. And John, Bryce Young, number two overall recruit in his class, which although they were both five stars, 30 spots higher than Tua was in his class. So the upside is there. And we certainly have some rushing upside of mobility as well. John, back to the Mac we go, baby. Dustin Crum out of Kent State coming in at number five here. Crum, another guy that reportedly had kind of flirted with the idea of going to the NFL. He will be back here with Kent State for his final uh, collegiate season and definitely some big number upside with him. Oh, Matt, we are so happy. When he went to the draft advisory board, they gave him a fifth round or later grade. And for us college fantasy football people, Dustin Crum decided to come back to Kent State. And I actually think he made the right decision on returning. I don't even know if he would have been drafted. So I'm very happy that the young man decided to come back and up his draft stock. 6'3", 207 pounds. Again, defensively challenged conference. What makes him so special? This offense last year produced 49 points per game, 606 yards per game. Let me repeat that, 606 yards per game. Now, it was a small sample, 4-1. and one. Kent State didn't play a ton of games. But this offense is loaded. Dustin Crum is a dual-threat quarterback. In 2019, 707 yards rushing, 2,622 yards passing, and 26 total touchdowns. Your only concern, Matt, early in the season, Kent State plays at Texas A&M. That's going to be a problem. And they play Iowa. That's the only reservation because those are really bad matchups. But once you get past those two matchups, Kent State's going to rock. That offense is going to roll in the Mac. Love Dustin Crumb. And, John, if you want to play a little strategy, look at schedules ahead of time, yes. right? Because some of these it's, – it's the opposite, right? Some of these Power 5 programs are beating <laughs> up on the group of five programs. And so can you later in your draft get a starter at a big school who might be able to put up great numbers when they're playing a Mac team? And you can offset that with Dustin Crumb. All right, coming in at number four here, DJU out of Clemson. It's We talked about Bryce Young, and these two are going to be compared like Justin Fields and, and Trevor Lawrence were, right? They're going to be tied together throughout their college career. What's exciting about DJU compared to Bryce Young is we got to see some DJU last season because, unfortunately, Trevor Lawrence missed some time with COVID, and we got to see DJU. And, of course, the Notre Dame game sticks out as a, as a really – you know, shining example of what DJU could do on the top stage, just being thrown right into it. Dual threat upside, of course, John. I mean, there the sky is the ceiling, right, when we're talking about him? Oh, Matt. It, I remember when Dabo Sweeney first took over Clemson, and they were actually a running team with C.J. Spiller, and they had another running back, Davis. I forgot his first name. They were like the hammer and the lightning out at Clemson. And then he got Taj Boyd. And ladies and gentlemen, in 2011, Taj Boyd was a star at Clemson. And look at the numbers for three years. Taj Boyd was solid college fantasy football gold. But then he started recruiting cream of the crop. He got Deshaun Watson and Trevor Lawrence. Now he's got arguably the top prospect in the 20s. 
19 recruiting class. This is how good first-year quarterbacks have done in Dabo Sweeney's offense, Matt. On average, Boyd, Watson, and, and um, Trevor Lawrence, and this includes Kelly Bryant. I put him in, too, so we get a, a wide spectrum. First-year quarterbacks have averaged 3,500 yards passing, 541 yards rushing, and 35 total touchdowns. Matt, I don't need a PhD to know that DJU is going to smash in college fantasy football this year for the Tigers. Awesome, John. And somebody who I think we both also expect to smash is Matt Corral playing in Lane Kiffin's Old Miss offense here. I think we saw in year one just how dangerous and fun this offense can be. Also, how much that roster is going to rely on their offense, and they're going to be on the field a ton because the defense and the secondary does not return the level of excitement here. And I want to – like this, I, I expect the offense to take another step forward this year uh, so I love having Matt Corral as a top three college fantasy football quarterback. Oh, Matt, we have fantasy gold. We have an offensive-minded coach with a defensively challenged roster, and they are going to be in shootouts where each team is going to have to put up six or seven touchdowns on a regular basis. And, Matt, I laugh at people who don't study schemes. When Matt Corral was in Rich Rodriguez's scheme his freshman year at Mississippi, he lost the job to John Reese Plumley. Ladies and gentlemen, John Reese Plumley cannot throw the football. Great he's, runner. He's a, he's a wide receiver now, right? <laughs> yes, he moved. He converted. Yeah. Yes. But Matt Corral was so out of place in that system. Then they bring in Lane Kiffin. And Jeff Leiby and Lane Kiffin, their system is perfect for Matt Corral's skill set. Last year, first year in the system, 3,337 yards passing, 506 yards rushing, and 33 total touchdowns. Absolutely love them there. Lane Kiffin, I think Lane Kiffin secretly wants a Heisman winner. He's never had one. It would cement his coaching tenure and his offensive scheme. I think he's going to do everything he can to get Corral in the Heisman conversation. And ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the interesting things about college fantasy football. There are coaches who want their players to win the Heisman. There are other coaches who are not that concerned. Look at Lane Kiffin wants a Heisman trophy. Mississippi fans want a Heisman Trophy. If Mississippi's going to compete in the SEC West, this is the year they have an outside chance. I don't think they're not the favorite in my book. But if you're going to take on Alabama, LSU, Texas A&M, this is the year to do it. So I think Corral's going to be monster this year. Yeah, it would be an interesting conversation, which – we could probably do an entire episode on a six. Could you have a, a team with six wins produce a Heisman candidate? That, I mean, that's that, an interesting, you know, but, yes. but uh, uh, we shouldn't digress because we will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Coming in at number two here, uh, Spencer Rattler for a lot of folks kind of locked in as the QB one in the 2022 class. He's not locked in for me, but I think me he's either. leading the race in the preseason here. And, of course, this is the year, John, you know, we saw some really good flashes out of Rattler. We're expecting a whole lot more this year. And what helps him compared to Clemson, compared to Alabama, Oklahoma beats up on defenses playing in the Big 12. Uh -huh. And the protection around Rattler, the weapons around Rattler are, you know, comparable to anybody in the country. So he has everything in the toolbox to make it happen. Oh, Matt, I've got – Seven words, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and Jalen Hurts. If you if you understand this is the system, the scheme, and the talent, all meet together for fantasy gold. Oklahoma, now, I don't think they're as loaded as Alabama and USC and probably LSU at wide receiver, but they're pretty close. They're in the conversation. 
And Rattler has a dynamic running back, Eric Gray, who's an excellent pass catcher. Spencer Rattler should produce over 40 total touchdowns for the Sooners. The only thing that what made Jalen Hurts and Kyler Murray so special was their ability to score fantasy points on the ground. I think Rattler's more of a Baker Mayfield. He's very good with his legs, but he's not going to get like 800 yards rushing like Murray and Hurts, but he's probably going to produce more passing. So I think he's a little closer to Baker than he is to Hurts and Murray from fantasy upside. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right with that. And coming in at number one, John, you referenced him at the opening of this episode. That's Malik Willis out of Liberty, which, by the way, I always mess this up. I'm still getting used to it. Liberty is an independent school. They are not an FCS school. They were an FCS school, and I believe they have two seasons, three seasons as a independent here. Yeah. So they, they've transitioned, which also makes their schedule an interesting thing to navigate here when thinking about who Liberty actually plays but Malik, Willis, no one. <laughs> but Malik Willis, of course, jumps out of the gate here. Uh, number one. He jumped out of the gate, I should say, last year. and He's number one for us this year. Matt, I was shocked. I mean, obviously he went to Auburn. He lost the job to Bo Nix. And that's a different story for a different day, how he lost the job to Bo Nix. But he ends up at Liberty. Now, he was the type of player like, look, we know coming out of high school how good he was. But now he's going to Liberty, which isn't a NF, which isn't a powerhouse. They're an independent program, kicking off basically their third season at the FCS level. Malik Willis was the best quarterback in college fantasy football last year. He was unbelievable. 6'1", 215 pounds. And Matt, has there anyone in the Debbie community who's risen higher in the last four weeks that or four months than Malik Willis? I bet you if we were talking to Debbie people last November, most people weren't even discussing Malik Wills. I said on a podcast, why with, with my partners, Eric and Scott, why is no one talking about Malik Willis as an NFL or Debbie player? Like literally no one mentioned him. I had seen him. Now, I question his passing, and I think he has some growth to do. However, he definitely deserves to be in the conversation. I'm not as bullish because I need to see more this year. But, man, from his ability to produce with his legs, it is silly. My partner Nick has him projected at 885 yards rushing, 3,389 yards passing, and 43 total touchdowns. Matt, his projections are 38 fantasy points per game. I don't have to say anything out. Anything else, Malik Willis is in that conversation as a college fantasy quarterback, as Lamar Jackson. He is just simply unbelievable. Yeah, I'm looking at my my scouting evaluations here, and I have him just below Carson Strong, but above Desmond Ritter. So if you're thinking in NFL draft terms, that's where I have him. But, John, you have to translate to college fantasy football. we got to drive this home here. I'm going to quickly read off the Liberty schedule for this up. Oh, Are you ready for this? <laughs> Campbell, <laughs> Troy, right. Old Dominion. Oh, watch out, John. We're playing Syracuse. All right. Oh. Uh, Alabama, Birmingham, Middle Tennessee, Louisiana, Monroe, North Texas, the UMass Minutemen. All right, here we go. They play Mississippi. All right. They're going to face off against Matt Corral. And then they finish the season against Louisiana, the region Cajuns, and then Army. All right. There's going to be some big weeks there. <laughs> Matt, I'm going to tell every listener a secret. If you want a defense in college fantasy football, Liberty is costing you nothing. I have them in three best ball leagues because the schedule is just so easy, dude. And what's going to happen is Malik Wills is going to get up 28 to nothing on some of these schools, and the defense is just going to tee off with a pass rush and pick up. Oh, Matt, it's gold in, in college fantasy football. All right, John, we want to wrap up these episodes here with some quick sleepers here. So me and John have both identified three potential sleepers at the quarterback position. And I'm going to start here with uh, Tolia Tali. I always get it wrong. I apologize. Tagovailoa, the younger brother of Tua Tagovailoa, playing for the University of Maryland and Alabama transfer here. 
And there's not a lot to bank on, all right? This is not an early draft pick. We're talking about guys that you can get late or even guys that you're going to watch on the waiver wire. Maryland had a weird season, all right? There was ups and downs. They only ended up playing four games. But we saw some really awesome flashes of passing ability from Tagovailoa, and we also saw some good rushing upside. So if you pull up the stats, it's only 1,000 passing yards. It's a seven touchdown to seven interception ratio. It's not great. But if you hone in on some specific games, go back and watch the Minnesota game and you see some upside. So Tagovailoa is somebody you're probably not going to want to invest a high pick on, but definitely somebody worth keeping an eye on here as you advance later or even as a waiver wire priority once the season gets going. Another sleeper here for me, John, is Ken Seals out of Vanderbilt, 6'3", 220. He started as a true freshman, completed 65% of his passing yards, or 65% of his attempts, I should say, 1,920 passing yards in nine games for Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt, John, last year in COVID was obliterated. By the end of the season, I believe they were playing with less than two-thirds of their actual roster. They started letting letting players just opt out if they wanted to go home. So Vanderbilt was, was in a very weird situation they have the new coaching staff coming in from Notre Dame. There's a lot of buzz around the program. So Ken Seals is somebody I'd keep an eye on as well. And then my last sleeper here, John, a transfer from Arizona, now playing at Memphis, is Grant Gannell, 6'6", 228, and a really big arm behind him. He has a nice touchdown-interception ratio, 15-3 to over his first two seasons playing at Arizona. And playing in the American, I think he's going to have the ability to put up some really big stats and numbers. So those are my three sleepers, John, which, of course, always has a little bit of a de of, of a de Devi uh, a tinge yeah. on it, maybe, perhaps. Uh, but we'll go ahead. And uh, any thoughts on those guys before we jump into your sleepers? I like all of them. They're the type of player. What I recommend to everyone who listens to um, the podcast or when Matt and I are doing these shows, we did them last year's also. When you have sleepers like we're listing, we're going to give you six total, draft one of them. We're not saying to go out and draft three of them. It's because I want two of the top 24 that we just went over. And then I'm going to wait a long time in my draft. And I'm going to try to get one of these, maybe two if, I, if, it, if you're going five quarterbacks. It depends on roster size. But I would say get one. And probably find the one at the best value late in the draft. Now, some of the six are probably going to be on the waiver wire, even depending on the size of your league. Absolutely. But, but that, we're not telling you to go out and draft three of our sleepers. Be strategic and use our top 24 to build your quarterback room and then acquire one of these players to, that might pop and uh, in bye weeks you can put into your lineup. Absolutely here. And, John, you have three more for us. Last year we all saw Kyle Trask. This year Emory Jones steps into the quarterback position. And there was a good chance, Matt, that Emory Jones, they wanted him to be the quarterback two years ago. But when Felipe Franks got hurt and Kyle Trask went into the lineup, he played well, Matt. The the, the Dan Mullen and the coaching staff couldn't bench Kyle Trask. So you end up sitting Emory Jones, highly recruited four-star prospect, 6'2", 210 pounds, dual-threat quarterback. But I'll tell you this, he's a better thrower than people are giving him credit for. I don't. He's not in that Lamar Jackson. Our projections with my teammate Nick, 2,900 yards passing, 346, 346 yards rushing, and 35 touchdowns. So Emory Jones, we project to score over 27 points per game. Right now he's going off in the 10th round map of college fantasy football drafts. With that upside in Dan Mullen's system, Emory Jones is a must-buy sleeper. My just the guy who I've got way too many shares of. Ladies and gentlemen, I watch a lot of American Athletic Conference. But I'm not going to draft the guy I don't believe in or I don't like when I watch. But Michael Pratt had a tremendous freshman season, everyone. He had 1,806 yards passing, 
20 touchdowns. Matt, what I like about him is a true freshman, only eight interceptions. The young man is good with the football, 55% of his passes. So he needs to get better throwing the football. But I'll give him a mulligan as a true freshman in COVID to take over that green wave offense, and he played well. But more importantly, dual threat player. 229 yards rushing, eight touchdowns. Michael Pratt, I have him in five of my 10 drafts so far. He costs you basically nothing. And as a fourth quarterback, absolutely love him. If you've listened to me in this spring, I've been waxing about this UTSA offense. They're very good folks. Last year, they scored 28 points per game, produced 415 yards per game. Their running back, Sincere McCormick, we're going to talk about next year as a first-round draft pick. But give me Frank Harris. He is a round 17 pick, Matt. He's the idea fourth quarterback. We project him at 22 points a game, 2,374 passing yards, 245 rushing yards, and 24 total touchdowns. I like Frank Harris. He's a great fourth quarterback. And in the 17th round of a draft, Matt, I'll go there any day. Those are my three sleepers, everyone. Fantastic sleepers, John, to go along with our 24 other quarterbacks that we listed here. Beginning our college fantasy football preview series, John, which is going to lead us right up to the college football season. It's going to be here sooner than we realize. 